Hello, this is Jack Jackson with part three of our series of lectures on inferential statistics. Today we're going to introduce hypothesis testing, and we're going to do this by specifically looking at a z-test, and uh, actually specifically a two-tailed z-test. And the basic things that we're going to learn here with this example are going to be the basic ideas of hypothesis testing in general. So first of all, let's look at some basic ideas of hypothesis testing. In general, what we do with hypothesis testing is we use it to determine if the amount of difference between a statistic from an observed sample and either the corresponding assumed population parameter or perhaps another statistic from a different observed sample, if this difference is likely to be due to inherent randomness of the distribution, or is it more likely to be due to the observed sample being from a different distribution? We're going to use this to help us make decisions. So let's look at an example here or some basic setup. Suppose we find the mean of a sample and compare it to the mean of a known population. So that's going to be the context we're going to do uh, for this particular lecture. Well, there's always some variability. If we take a sample, we expect the sample mean will probably be different from the mean of the known population. And if we did another sample, we get a different mean. And again, and again, and again. And remember that these sample means will have a distribution of their own. Okay? And if the, um, the mean of that distribution should be the mean of the target population if they actually came from that population. And we're going to assume here that the distribution of individuals in the known target population is normal. And of course the sample means will naturally vary. Within the distribution of sample means is also normal with the same mean and smaller standard deviation. In fact, we'll, we'll assume that the distribution of individuals is normal in the example we're looking at today, but in fact, all we really need is for the distribution of sample means to be normal. Uh, basically the same uh, assumptions that we had back when we were doing Z intervals, confidence intervals. Now, there are two possible causes, two possible types of causes for the difference in the mean of the sample and the mean of the population is drawn from. We're going to classify these as normal causes and special causes. In normal causes, the difference in means is due to random variation in the distribution of sample means. Of course, we expect these, um, if they come from this hypothesized target population, there's going to be some variation, but of course those sample means are going to be normally distributed. That's one of our underlying assumptions. And that means that most of the time they're going to be coming from somewhere near the mean. Remember the normal curve, it's bell shaped, it's humped up near the middle, a lot of area near the mean, and less and less as you go further away. So very high probability that the sample mean will be close to the actual mean, but it's not likely to be straight exactly on it. So in the normal cause that does come from the target population, there's just some random variation that comes from that. It's likely that the, these differences will be relatively small. And if, if, the rel if the difference is relatively small, then it is likely that they come from, that's because of it's a normal cause. And so we assume that it's a normal cause or that it comes from this hypothesized target population unless there's preponderance of evidence suggesting otherwise. Now, when we have special causes, the difference in means is due to something different about the sample. The sample is not from the hypothesized target population. And it's, like, uh, it's likely that this is the case if there is a sufficiently large difference in the means. Now, notice I've, I've uh, talked about a couple of words here, preponderance of evidence, sufficiently large. Those are kind of vague terms. What do we mean by those? Well, we're going to quantify those a little bit later as we go along. So let's first of all look at some examples here of um, normal and special causes. So suppose we're measuring weights of people. 
Well, there's going to be some normal variation in weight changes, let's say changes over time in weight. And normally people go up and down a little bit in their weight. But if you had uh, a group of people, and suppose we're going to test out to see how effective a diet is. Well, if there are large weight losses from the people that are on this diet, much larger than the normal weight losses that you might see from anybody in the population, or perhaps from a control group, then we know that the uh, diet was effective. So if it's sufficiently more of a weight loss than just sort of the average person, then we know that this is a special group. This, this is not from the every person. It's from this group of people that did this diet, and it was effective. Or, for example, we know that if we check people's blood pressure, uh, there's going to be some normal variation from time to time, uh, particularly, say, even just the same person. But if we see large drops in blood pressure from the people using a blood pressure medicine, then we would have uh, reason to believe that that blood pressure medicine is actually effective, that those, those, that drop in blood pressure was not just due to some randomness in you know, taking the blood pressure from one time to the next, but rather was an effect of the medicine. It's going to be very important for us to know that because we want to be able to trust that that medicine is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, here's a manufacturing example. Normal variation in diameters of pistons from variations in the, in the process of making them. There's going to be some slight variations in materials and their methods and the machines that make this up. But if the uh, process is what they sometimes refer to as under control, then that process will be producing pistons with diameters that are probably normally uh, distributed and certainly means of samples will be normally distributed. Okay, But suppose all of a sudden we now take a sample and we get sub significantly smaller diameters of pistons. Well, maybe that could be a result of some special cause, like maybe we have a broken machine or somebody's miscalibrated it. Somebody's adjusted something and now the thing's out of whack a little bit. Okay, so there's some sort of cause there, and so we can test that with hypothesis testing. And again, notice how you can use this to help us make decisions. Is this diet effective or not? Is this blood pressure medicine effective or not? Is this uh, machine, is something happening with this machine that, that uh, says that we need to do something to adjust it? So the basic idea of hypothesis testing is going to uh, allow us to quantify what we mean by the differences in means or, or perhaps in some other statistic like the, like the variance or something like that. And, and we want to see if this is sufficiently large enough to have a preponderance of evidence suggesting that special causes of variation are present and the sample comes from a different population than the hypothesized target population. So we've got this population out here we think that this is drawing from. Um, or maybe we suspect it's not, but we assume that it's uh, from this standard population, and then we uh, go forward to uh, try to see if we've got enough evidence to show that it's not from this population. And so we're going to be able to come up with a method of, of quantifying this and give us a numerical measure that measures how much you know, we are likely to have this from a different population. And then we can use these numbers to help us make decisions. Now, I want to use a justice system as an analogy, and I think this is the best analogy I've ever heard of uh, to come up with, and, it, and it, it helps explain a little bit what how hypothesis testing works. Now, the first thing you have is you have two hypotheses. You have the null hypothesis, H sub 0, and the alternative hypothesis, and some people will call that H sub 1, and some will call it H sub A. Um, so the null hypothesis is something that we just assume is the case. So in the, in the justice system in the United States, the basic tenet of the justice system is innocent until proven guilty. So the defendant is, is uh, considered innocent, and the null hypothesis is that that's a true statement, that the defendant actually is innocent and did not commit the crime. 
Notice that the defense does not have to prove innocence. What they merely have to do is show that there is some reasonable doubt about their guilt. Okay. So notice you do not prove the null hypothesis. You do not prove innocence. What you do is you, uh, the burden of proof is on the, def the prosecution in the, the justice system case. The defendant is guilty of committing the crime is the alternative hypothesis. And the pro prosecution wants to prove guilt. And of course when they, when they prove guilt in the justice system um, setting, what they're doing is they're showing that they have a preponderance of evidence that supports their claim, this alternative claim, that, that the defendant is guilty of committing whatever this crime is beyond a reasonable doubt. And notice the burden of proof is with, the, with or on the prosecution. Okay, so the prosecution must prove that they're guilty. And if they can't prove that they're guilty, we assume that they're innocent and we get a not guilty verdict. So, in general, the null hypothesis is the basic assumption that the sample came from the hypothesized target population. We assume the null hypothesis is true unless there is very strong evidence to suggest otherwise. And this basic assumption is going to tell us what the distribution is uh, that we assume everything is working on. And this will allow us, since we make some assumptions about these probabilities that are here, and what we know about probability, and statistics, particularly about sampling distributions and normal distributions, those things will tell us something about uh, methods that we can use to compute some probabilities. And that's what's going to allow us to quantify what's going on. The alternative hypothesis is usually what we're trying to prove. So if you're trying to prove, for example, that this diet works, then the alternative hypothesis is that the diet works, that the uh, mean weight loss, for example, is is more than uh, just would happen randomly. The alternative is is that these people taking this uh, diet, following this diet, are no different than any other uh, control group or anybody else, and their weight losses would be, the, would be the same. Now what do we do? We assume that, the, that this diet is not working. We have to prove that it's going to work, and so the alternative hypothesis is what we're trying to prove. Uh, in the piston example, we assume that these pistons have been doing what they've been doing for years, coming off the line with the same mean, same standard deviation, the same uh, distribution. And now what we want to do is say, oh, wait a minute, I think now uh, they're a little bit less than they were before. Something's happened, so we need to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. We must have strong evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. It has to be somewhat overwhelming evidence, significant evidence. So let's look at back to our justice system analogy. There are two different conclusions that we can come up with, or two different verdicts. One is guilty and the other is not guilty. Guilty verdict uh, corresponds to rejecting the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So essentially, the, we, we think that the alternative hypothesis is true or we have enough evidence to suggest that it is true. And so this would be the case where the prosecution has produced enough evidence to convince the jury that the defendant committed the crime beyond any reasonable doubt. Notice that the other possible verdict is not guilty. In this case, this is failing to reject the null hypothesis. So the prosecution has failed to produce enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was guilty. So we go back to the default assumption that the, it was innocent until proven guilty. Since they didn't prove it was guilty, he was guilty, then we assume that he is innocent. Notice that this is subtly different than a verdict of innocent. There's never a verdict of innocent. Okay? We don't prove that they're innocent. Okay? 
The defense doesn't have to prove that the defendant is innocent. We just have to show that there's some reasonable doubt. Okay? And if there's a reasonable doubt, if there's even a good possibility that they might be innocent, then we just assume they're innocent. We don't have to prove that. Okay? It's the same way with uh, hypothesis testing in general. We never prove the null hypothesis. We assume the null hypothesis unless we can prove the alternative hypothesis, unless there's enough evidence beyond in a reasonable doubt, preponderance of evidence that says that uh, the guilty verdict in, the, in this case or the in general that the alternative hypothesis is true, if we can get that, then we, then we reject the null hypothesis, but otherwise we fail to reject. It's not prove the null hypothesis, but rather fail to reject. It's kind of a subtle difference there. Now, there's actually really four possible outcomes. Okay, two of them are good outcomes and two are bad outcomes. So we could either, the null hypothesis could actually be true or the alternative hypothesis could actually be true. For example, the null hypothesis, remember, was that the defendant is innocent. Well, they could actually be innocent, or they could actually be guilty. Those are the two possibilities there. But then there's two uh, verdicts. They could either be found guilty, a verdict of guilty is returned, or a verdict of not guilty is returned. So remember, a verdict of guilty is rejecting uh, the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis, and the not guilty verdict is where we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And if we put these together, two of these things are good. So, for example, if the alternative hypothesis is true, in other words, the defendant is actually guilty, and a guilty verdict is returned, that's good. That's what you want to have happen, is to convict the guilty. And so that is a type A correct conclusion. A guilty defendant is convicted. You could also have a good conclusion is this. If the defendant is actually innocent, you want a re return a verdict of not guilty. Okay, so if the null hypothesis is true, we want to fail to reject it. If that happens, then we have a type B correct conclusion. So that would be an innocent defendant is acquitted in our uh, justice system example. So type A correct conclusion the alternative hypothesis is actually true, and we uh, reject it. So, reject the uh, null hypothesis because the alternative hypothesis is true. We reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. That's a type A correct conclusion. Uh, oftentimes, that's what you're looking for in a research situation. Another good result is that the null hypothesis is true and we fail to reject it so that's a type B correct conclusion but now there's two possible errors that we can have the type 1 error is um, the null hypothesis is true but we still reject it okay that's a type 1 error and in the justice system case that is an innocent defendant is convicted mm, that's bad that's a bad result. That's a type 1 error. Type 1 error is when the null hypothesis is true, but we still reject it anyway in favor of the alternative hypothesis. That's a type 1 error. The type 2 error is the other possible thing that could go wrong, and that is the alternative hypothesis is true, but we, um, but we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? So the alternative hypothesis is true, but we don't really accept it. Uh, justice system example, a guilty defendant is acquitted, a not guilty verdict when the person really is guilty. That's a type 2 error. Type 1 and type 2 errors are both bad. Type A correct conclusion, type B correct conclusion are both good. Now we have conditional probabilities associated with these four uh, different things. So a probability of a type 1 error, we're going to call that alpha. Of all of these, this is the most important one, alpha. And the probability of a type 1 error 
is the probability that we reject the null hypothesis given that the null hypothesis is true. Uh, for example, uh, alpha would be the probability the defendant is convicted given that the defendant is innocent. Notice that is a conditional probability. The complement of that, 1 minus alpha, is the probability of a type B correct conclusion. Okay, that is the probability that we fail to reject the null hypothesis given that the null hypothesis is true. And that's, of course, that's just 1 minus alpha. So the probability the defendant is acquitted given that the defendant is actually innocent. So both of those, both the type 1 error and the type B correct conclusion, uh, are given that the null hypothesis is actually true, in this case that the defendant is actually innocent. So those two probabilities have to add up to 1. Now the probability the other type of error, type 2 error, is beta. And remember, a type 2 error is where we fail to reject the null hypothesis, but we know we are given that the null hypothesis is actually false. Okay, um, our example is the probability that a guilty defendant is, a, is, a, is actually acquitted. Uh, the probability the defendant is acquitted given that the defendant is actually guilty. And then... Um, the complement of that, 1 minus beta, is the probability of a type A correct conclusion that we re probability reject a null hypothesis given that the null hypothesis is false. Uh, for in this example, for the justice system, that's the probability the defendant is convicted given that the defendant is guilty. So we have two types of errors, alpha and beta. What do we really want? We want both of these things to be very small. So ideally, we want probabilities of alpha, the probability of a type 1 error, and beta, the probability of a type 2 error, to both be very small. But the problem is, these things work against each other. Usually making one of alpha or beta, beta smaller makes the other larger. For example, if we decrease the chances of convicting an innocent person, decrease alpha, that's likely to increase the chance of letting a guilty person go free increasing beta. Now, you may or may not like it this way, but it, a tenet of the American justice system, one basic premise is it's better to let a guilty person go free than it is to convict an innocent person. Uh, we've, I've even heard things say like it's better to let ten crooks go free than to convict one innocent guy. So more attention in the American justice system is placed on making alpha small. And it's basically the same way in hypothesis testing. We focus most of our attention on alpha. The, uh, the tests are all designed with alpha in mind, and we basically are going to look at alpha to decide basically whether we, to make our decision, ultimately that along with the, the information from our sample, to ultimately make our decision about whether to accept or reject the null hypothesis. So what we're going to do is we'll decide on an acceptable level for alpha and then use our knowledge of sampling distributions to determine a threshold beyond which we have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Beta does come into play in something called the power of a test and uh, if we have time we may get back to that later but we're going to focus our attention on alpha for the rest of this lecture. Now let's look at a manufacturing example. Now suppose we're making pistons and we know uh, the historical data. Let's suppose we know that the population uh, diameters, diameters of individuals in the population are distributed normally with a mean of 4.25 centimeters and a standard deviation of 0.12 centimeters. Now suppose we take a sample of size n equals 16 and we compute its mean to be 4.31. Now notice the 4.31 for x bar is different than our mu of 4.25. x bar not equal to mu. Well, we expect there to be some variation in this. Here's the big question. 
Is this variation just something that would normally occur? Or is this excessive variation that would suggest to us that something's happened to this manufacturing process to start making larger pistons? It's going to be important for us to know this because if we're in the in the working in this company, if they're all of a sudden they're making larger pistons than we are before, that means we're probably producing a bunch of them that are out of product specification, and the whole the whole thing's in bad shape. And so we need to intervene and make a make a adjustment. However, if this is just something that's just from random variation within a good process, then if we go in and start changing things, then we're likely to cause a lot more harm than good. So we need to know, is there enough evidence to suggest that the sample uh, came from a different population than the historical, historical population? That's our big question. Is this difference, we know there's some difference here, we know this sample means bigger than the, the population mean that we think it was coming from or we used to think it was coming from. The question is, is this statistically significant enough of a difference to suggest that the actual population has changed? That's the big question. We want to quantify that. So, um, here's our basic setup. So, the random variable x is the diameter of an individual piston. The basic assumption is that x is distributed normally with a standard deviation of 0.12, and the null hypothesis, h sub 0, is that the mean of the distribution that we're drawing from is 4.25 centimeters. And the alternative hypothesis in this case, we're going to do what's called a two-tailed test with one sample. And so the alternative is that the H1 or HA is that mu is just something different than the 4.25. Well, the measured sample mean was X bar, which is 4.31. The sample size is N equals 16. Now, the next thing we have to do is to decide on a level for alpha. Now... Um, it really depends on what you're doing, what alpha needs to be. For a manufacturing situation, alpha might be fairly big. Even an alpha of maybe 0.2 might be enough to go in and try to make a change and then test it out and see what happens. If you're doing a drug test, an alpha of 0.2 is way too big. You probably want a 0.1 or that's probably even better, a 0.01. It depends a little bit about on what you're doing. But, you know, the, the typical suspects uh, are the same ones we, we had back when we were doing confidence intervals. 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, you know, in other words, 1%, 5%, 10%. Those are, those are kind of typical uh, choices. Let's use 10% here, 0 0.1 for alpha. Now, the distribution of the individual diameters, if our null hypothesis is true, is going to be a normal distribution with mean 4.25 and standard deviation 0.12. And here it is. Uh, this plot came from Minitab. So there's a, there's a graph there. Now, remember that when we look at sample means, they have a different distribution. They have a same mean, uh, 4.25, but a smaller standard deviation. It's the standard deviation of the x's divided by the square root of the sample size. So it's 0.12 over the square root of 16. That works out uh, to be 0 0.03. Uh, notice the uh, contrived data there, so they get a really nice number there. And so we look at that distribution, and of course it has the same mean and a smaller standard deviation. That gives us the red graph here, whereas the black graph is the individuals. The red graph is the distribution of sample means when we have samples of size 16 taken from this same distribution. Now what we really want to do is we're going to work with uh, this red graph. So we're going to ignore the, the black one, look at the red one, but I'm going to readjust the scale a bit. And readjusting the scale uh, gives us this graph right here. So this blue one here is the same as the red one on the last picture. And so here is our distribution. It's a distribution of X bar values which are normal with mean 4.25 and standard deviation 0.3. And we see where X bar falls on that. It's kind of over here to the right side, and you can see where that falls. So, hmm, I, you know, if, if I did this and I found that X bar was way over there close to the middle of the mu, the 4.25, I'd 
you know you could probably look at it and say for sure that that's that's not so uh, you know that's not so unusual. If this is way out further to the right, like past 4.35, I definitely look at that and say, okay, uh, that's pretty obvious. That's uh, that's that's too much variation. But this one's kind of maybe questionable. Is this is this enough to be really unusual, or is this uh, okay? Hmm. Let's see if we can put some number in it based on the alpha that we have. Now we have two basic approaches here. One is to compare X bar values or the Z scores of these values. We compute a test statistic, X bar star, or its normalized, uh, standardized score, the Z star that goes with this. And that's a sample mean value. And we're going to compute it to a probability of alpha. It corresponds to a probability of alpha, I'm sorry and compare it to the measured X bar value for the sample. Actually the Z star it corresponds to the X bar value. And then this up here is our limit. Now the other, so what we're doing is we're comparing X's to X's or Z's to Z's. A p-value approach is we want to compare probabilities to probabilities. Of course probabilities are areas, so we're comparing one area to another area or one probability to another probability. So here what we do is we compute the area or probability that corresponds to the measured sample mean and compare it back to alpha. So we're going to show you both methods here and try to make some sense out of these. So the classical test statistic approach is this. Uh, remember the alternative hypothesis is just that mu is not equal to mu sub zero. So this is a two-tailed test. So if we got a two-tailed test, we want to split our alpha into two halves. So we would take our point one for alpha, split it into two equal pieces, which are alpha over two, which in this case is, uh, I should say, 0 0.05, not a, not a diagonal slash there. So 0 0.05 is it. Compute the critical values A and B, our limits of our critical region, so that alpha over 2, that's 0 0.05, is the probability or area for the sample mean to be below A, and it's also the same probability above B. Now this is, comes from a normal distribution where we know the mean and standard deviation, so we can just use an inverse norm on our calculator to do that. We do inverse norm of 0 .5, 0 0.05, excuse me, comma the mean of 4.25, comma the standard deviation of the means, which is 0 0.03, and we get about 4.2. Okay, and then if we do the inverse norm of 0.95. That'll have 0.5 above it there, so below it is 0.95. Uh, again, same mean, same standard deviation. You get about 4. Point, well, about 4.3, 4.29934, etc. Well, these are our A and B uh, critical values, and if you look at this picture, uh, there's your 4.2 and your 4.3 right there, which are boundaries of these red regions. So it's to the left of A, A was 4.2, that's shaded red, and to the right of B, uh, that's also shaded red. And what's happening is, is we have the, the, um, <clears throat> the point one is split up into half in each of these regions. Okay, now... What we're going to do is we're going to, in this case, reject the null hypothesis because we want to see if how the X bar compares to these values of A and B. If it's to the right of, a, of B or to the left of A, in other words, if it's anywhere in the red critical region, then it's going to be, um, we're going to reject it. Okay? And so in that, in that red region, that's what's going to be um, rejected. And so 4.31 is bigger than 4.3. It's in the red region. And so we reject the null hypothesis. What does this mean? Well, it means that it's so unlikely, such a small probability that it's, you know, if, if it lands in any of the red, the probability that X bar would land in something in the red is alpha, which is 0.1. Okay? And since we, uh, it's in that region, that's a very small probability. The probability that we established is, is uh, our threshold there.
And so if we get something that's further out there that's in that red region, the probability of a type 1 error is small, smaller than alpha. And so we will go ahead and reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Now, this is usually not done on the, the distribution that we just looked at, but rather on a standardized version. The, in other words, the standard normal from mean of 0 and standard deviation of 1. And of course, if x bar is normal, then we take uh, with then we could just do x bar minus mu divided by the sigma of the uh, x bars. That is, x bar minus mu divided by uh, sigma of the x's over the square root of n. That has a tendency to be uh, distributed normally uh, with mean zeros and standard deviation 1, in other words, a standard normal. And so in our particular case, the x bar minus 4.25 over 0.03 is going to be standard normal. And so we can look at this on a standard normal curve. And notice this picture looks exactly like the last picture except for scale. We get exactly the same information out of this. So what we do is we can compute our test statistic uh, which is Z star and that's our mean of uh, 4.31 minus the hypothesized mean of 4.25 divided by the standard deviation of the x bars, 0 0.03, and that turns out to be exactly 2. And that we compare that to the critical region. Now, how do you find the critical region? Well, uh, same thing as before, except this time we don't have to enter in the 0, 1. We could just do an inverse norm of 0 0.05, which is our alpha over 2, and then uh, point 9.5, which is 1 minus alpha over 2, do an inverse norm. Of course, since this is centered up on 0, actually we only have to do one of these two things and then just use the opposite sign of that for the other one. So if one is 1.64, the other is negative 1.64 and vice versa. So we have these critical values of 1.64 and negative 1.64. In our case, our z star, which is 2, is greater than 1.64, and so we know we landed in the the red critical region and so we have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So notice what we're doing is we're basically computing a test statistic called the Z star which is uh, greater than in this case greater than our critical region. We also have to compute our critical regions boundaries of it especially. Now an alternative approach is the p-value approach. In a p-value approach, we're going to compute the probability of getting a sample mean as far or farther away from the hypothesized mean as the measured sample mean, given that the null hypothesis is true. This is going to be a probability value or a p-value. Uh, in this particular case, it's 0 .0455. Well, how do we do that? We just computed a probability, uh, this time not an inverse probability. So notice, notice before, let's back up a second here. Notice here, when we wanted to figure out our critical regions, we knew the probability of the, well, the alpha over 2 in this case, and we just did an inverse norm of that alpha over 2 to get our critical plot number of negative 1.64. And of course, by the symmetry, the other critical uh, number that's a boundary of our critical region is positive 1.64. So notice we were doing inverse norms because we knew the probability of alpha, uh, hence the probability of alpha over 2, and we used that to figure out the corresponding z values. In this case, we're going the other way. We don't know that. What we know is the x value, uh, and we want to find the probability. So we just do normal CDF uh, from 4.31 to infinity. In this case, I used 1,000 for infinity. Uh, in other words, there's so little area beyond 1,000 that uh, we can ignore it. I just did 1,000 because it's easy to type in. Um, we could have also, remember I've also told you one good way to use for infinity is just the hypothesized mean of 4.25 and then add about 10 standard deviations, which is a lot less than 1,000. So we go a little beyond that. That's fine too. Uh, so anyway, uh, then the next, so it's 4.31, that's the measured mean, uh, comma, something for infinity, comma, 4.25, that's the uh, hypothesized mean, and then 0 0.03, which is the standard deviation of the x bars. That's the standard deviation of the x's divided by the square root of n. Uh, 
And when you do that, we get 0.2275. Now, what is that? That's going to be that, that it's 4.31 or higher. But we're doing a two-tailed test, so that's only going to be half. We're going to need to compare that to half of alpha. So to, so to compare it to alpha, we need to double it. So in this case, uh, if it's a two-tailed test, we'll double it. If it's a one-tailed test, we won't double it. So I went ahead and multiplied by 2, and so that gives me my p-value, 0.4550124, or about 0 0.0455. And so we can compare that directly to alpha. And so our p is less than alpha. p is 0 0.0455. And any time you get a p-value less than alpha, we have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Let's look at the at visually on this. So here we find the 4.31, and we shade to the right of that, and of course we shade a corresponding piece on the other side, and figure that probability, uh, that was 0 0.0228 on each side, or a total of 0 0.045, or 46, something like that. And so we were comparing the blue area to alpha. Okay, now here's a comparison of the two approaches. So what we're actually doing, or, or really just the p-value approach here, because what we're doing is we're comparing the blue area to the red area. Okay, and so the red area is alpha, the blue area is p. If p is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. If p had been the same or, or bigger than alpha, then we would not reject the null hypothesis. And of course, the X bar is the region, is the boundary of the blue region, and if that's in the red region, then uh, the blue area will be smaller. So uh, both of these uh, methods correspond to each other here. So again, what are we doing? In the classical value, we're finding the X bar, or its corresponding Z value, we're finding this boundary value, 4.3, and we're comparing directly the 4.3 and the 4.31, or comparing their corresponding Z values. So it's X to X or Z to Z comparison. In the p-value approach, we're finding the blue area and the red area. The red area we're given is alpha. We're finding the blue area, and we're comparing them together, uh, comparing the probability. So you're either comparing probability to probability or Z to Z. So let's go over uh, what are our conclusions are, how do we make a decision, and how do we interpret that. So a small p-value, that is a p that's less than alpha, means that we do have enough evidence to accept the alternative hypothesis. So our conclusion is that we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. The probability that this sample came from the hypothesized distribution is below our threshold, so it's much more likely it came from something else. The probability is so small that this came from our hypothesized uh, distribution from the null hypothesis that we assume it's much more likely uh, to come from a different distribution altogether. It's much more likely that our alternative hypothesis is true. And it's enough more likely, threshold determined by alpha, that we have a very small probability of a type 1 error and so we're going to go ahead and reject the null hypothesis. The probability of making a type 1 error is actually P, and that's actually less than our threshold for a type 1 error, which was alpha. Now, if we have a large P value, a P that's greater than alpha, then we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. There is not enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis in this case and the probability that this sample came from the hypothesized distribution is above our threshold. So the probability of type 1 error is too big. It's P, which is greater than alpha, and that's too big, and we would reject, uh, we would not reject the null hypothesis. Uh, we would say that we would fail to reject it. We're not necessarily saying that it's more likely that the null hypothesis is true, what we're saying is, is the probability of making a type 1 error is too big, it's bigger than our threshold of alpha.
Again, we do not prove the null hypothesis. We fail to prove the alternative hypothesis uh, if P is too big. The value chosen for alpha is somewhat subjective. If the p-value approach is used and we report the p-value, which you should do, then it's really nice for the reader because the reader can easily compare this to a different chosen alpha value without having to redo the test and possibly could come up with a different conclusion. For example, if they came up with a p-value of 0.2, uh, if you're using um, let's say not point 0.2, let's say point, uh, zero 0.07 for p-value, point zero 0.07. Well, if I'm using an alpha of point 0.1, then I would ha p would be less than alpha, point zero 0.07 is less than point 0.1, so I would have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. But somebody else says, no, I have a higher criteria, a higher standard, I am only going to allow an alpha of 0 0.05. Then we see that P is 0 0.07. It is greater than alpha, and we reach a different conclusion. So the conclusion you reach depends on the level of alpha. Well, if you use the classical approach, you change alpha, you have to redo it and compute a new test statistic. The nice thing about this is once you've computed that P value, someone can change alpha, the reader can, for example, and can easily compare that to the same p-value you've uh, uh, chosen. So for this reason, I like the p-value approach, and you're going to see a little bit later in the next video that uh, this works better with your calculator as well. But uh, both approaches have their uh, advantages. And so we can talk about some variations on a theme here. Uh, still with the z-test, we can have basically three possibilities. There's a two-tailed test, and then there's two possibilities for a one-tailed test, a left-tailed or a right-tailed test. A two-tailed test has the alternative hypothesis being that mu is just not equal to mu sub zero. And of course you saw, and that's the example we did here in these notes, and you saw that we took that area alpha and split it into alpha over two, half in the left tail, half in the right tail. However, we could also do a left-tailed test, and so the only part we have shaded, uh, either blue or red, depending on which, which uh, you know, if we, if we use those same color schemes for the classical red approach and the, and the p-value blue approach, either way, uh, we're only going to shade the tail that's on the left side, and the alternative hypothesis is that mu is uh, basically in that critical region that's shaded to the left, that mu is left less than hypothesized mu zero. We can also do a right-tailed test, and the shaded tail will only be on the right side, and the alternative hypothesis there is that mu is greater than zero. And, and really, where we're really doing in the uh, null hypothesis, however, is that mu actually equals the mu sub zero, because that's the basic setup to get that particular distribution, is that we know what that mean is, and that's what everything's based on. I have seen books sometimes list the if the, uh, for example, if the alternative hypothesis is that mu is less than mu zero, they'll list the uh, null hypothesis as mu is greater than or equal to mu zero. But really, what you're really assuming is that mu actually equals mu zero, and that's how you do the whole test. Now, there's some other variations we can do besides that. Uh, we can make different assumptions, like one of the important ex assumptions here was that we were testing. Uh, drawing from a sample where we knew the standard deviation. Well, that's, um, that's not so likely to have happen. And so we can, uh, if we change that, dis that assumption, it actually leads us to something called a t-test rather than a z-test. We'll go over that in a later uh, video. Uh, we can also measure different things, not just different assumptions on our distribution, but we maybe could measure variances, for example. Well, variances have a different distribution. Or we might measure proportions. Uh, we might measure um, means. We might measure uh, standard deviations. So there are other things that we could be measuring, different statist statistics. But the basic idea of what we saw here in this, this lecture carries over to 
uh, all hypothesis testing situations. Basically what we have is we have some type of distribution of whatever uh, thing it is that we're measuring, some sampling distribution. And what we do is we can figure, for example, in the p-value approach, we're going to figure the p-value, which is the probability of a type 1 error. It will be some kind of shaded area, either a two-tailed or one-tailed area, and, and the graph of the PDF, and that's going to be the probability of a type 1 error. But then we have a threshold for how big a type 1 error we're going to possibly accept. That's going to be our alpha value, and we just compare that p-value to the alpha. Again, if p is smaller than alpha, then we reject the null hypothesis. If p is greater than or equal to alpha, we fail to reject. And so this basic idea works the same no matter what you're testing. And there's lots and lots and lots of different tests. We're going to go over several different ones in this class, but we're only going to scratch the surface of different ones that we can do. But they all have the same basic uh, interpretation of that p-value. So if they've done a, a, a test, each test has its own uh, assumptions, but if they've used the right test, they've made the right assumptions, then you can always interpret their answer the same way. Look at that p-value, now you know what it means, and you can use that to interpret so there's a uh, pretty good introduction, hopefully, to uh, um, hypothesis testing, and specifically a two-tailed z-test. And these basic ideas will carry forward to all hypothesis testing. If you really understand this particular example, um, then you can use that to build on understanding other examples as well.